Hi, this is Julie with an invitation for you before we begin. I know you're likely wondering how to make a strategic impact in these last days before the election. As you'll soon hear from our guest, Melissa Walker, contributing to state legislative races is an incredible way to do that. As you listen, I hope you'll be inspired and consider making a donation to the state's Project Giving Circle that my mother, sisters, niece, and I have initiated. Visit my bio at Mother's Quest Pod on Instagram or follow the link in the show notes to learn more about our circle and help us reach our goal before the election deadline next week. Now onto the show, an incredible conversation with States Project's Melissa Walker. Everybody can bring one friend. And when everybody brings one friend, you end up with a large and powerful group that can really move the needle on anything that you care to focus on. And that is very empowering. We do not have to be witnesses to what's happening to our democracy. We do not have to be witnesses to things that are against our values. We can get involved, especially when we walk with the people beside us. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. At time of recording, we are less than two weeks from the 2024 U.S. election. In preparation for this moment, I seized the opportunity to sit down with Melissa Walker, a children's book author turned powerful political advocate, instrumental in the founding of an organization called The States Project. Melissa's path to The States Project was paved in the election results of 2016, which, like it did for so many of us, became a catalyst for activism. Looking for a way to get more intimately involved in our democratic process, her journey took a powerful turn when she attended a holiday party where then New York State Senator Daniel Squadron opened her eyes to the influence of state governments. She learned that issues like education, health care, civil rights, and voting rights are often decided in state capitals, not Washington, D.C. This spark led her to gather other mothers and children's book authors in her own living room to create what they called a state's project giving circle. That group would go on to help flip legislative seats in Virginia in 2017, impacting the balance of power enough in that state that they expanded health care for 400,000 Virginians that year. Fast forward to 2024, the state's project giving circles now number over 200 across the country. And my mom, Fran, and I were trying to determine how we could make an impact in this year's election and transform our anxiety and fear into action. The answer came from my niece, Nicole whose work with the States Project inspired us to start our own giving circle, which we named Generations for the three generations of women we have engaged. It was also Nicole who invited Melissa to join our circle on Zoom so Melissa could help us make a strategic decision that resulted in us picking Pennsylvania to direct our funds. It seemed fitting then to invite Nicole to make this episode's dedication. Hello, I'm Nicole Lettery, and I'm honored to dedicate this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast to Melissa Walker, to my grandmother Fran and Aunt Julie, who have spearheaded our own family's giving circle, and to all the women and people coming together in giving circles across the country. These women inspire me with their deep commitment to leading their families, friends, and communities into action, especially in an election cycle when so much is at stake for our country's women and children. Through my role at the States Project and learning especially from Melissa, I've seen firsthand how strategic giving can amplify every dollar and make a powerful difference in who gains power in our state capitals. The next generation of women will be deeply impacted by what happens this election, and I'm so grateful for people like Melissa, my grandmother, Aunt Julie, and so many others who are fighting for a better future for all of us. Thank you, Nicole, for this dedication, for your powerful work with the States Project, for encouraging Grandma and me to take the lead on our Generations Giving Circle, and for introducing me to Melissa. This episode is the invitation we all need right now to look beyond the obvious and consider how strategic political giving in key states can create profound ripple effects across the country. Melissa helps us realize that by coming together with shared values and a sense of purpose, we can light the way for change. In these critical weeks before the 2024 U.S. election, I hope Melissa's epic life journey and her wisdom inspire all of us to use our power to make a difference and to bring someone else along. 
Whether you join our giving circle or decide to come together with a community of your own, this episode reminds us that we have agency and that collective strategic action, even in small steps, can shift the course of our democracy. I'm Julie Neal, and this is Mother's Quest. Melissa, welcome to the Mother's Quest podcast. I'm so honored to have you here. I've been incredibly inspired by you, your story, the work you're doing with the States Project, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to share all of those things, particularly at this time when we're getting so close to the election. Thank you, Julie. I'm so happy to be here. We're going to start with a question I ask every guest. Tell me a little bit about your own mother and the impact that she's had in shaping who you are today. Yeah. So my mother was a high school biology teacher and she's retired now. She was, she is an identical twin and she now lives in a retirement community directly next door to her identical twin. Um, oh, wow. Even though in their kind of family years, they lived in different states. My aunt lived in Texas and I grew up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but they've come back together, which I think is a really sweet, amazing sister thing. And my mother was really a doer. She was always busy. She was very busy with her work, teaching high school. And I remember that she would get home and she needed 30 minutes alone. She would go to her room and take 30 minutes. It was a very quick power nap situation before she came back down to the kitchen, started making dinner, kind of shepherded the rest of the family through our evening and then went to bed pretty early, often at the same time I did as a young child. And she got up really early too, around 5 a.m. She was just a doer, a constant doer. My father was more of a thinker. <laughs> So he was the one sitting in the living room at night, pondering big topics while my mother kind of moved around us and was a doer. So I learned how to keep moving and kind of seize the day and get a lot of things done from my mother, really. I can see those qualities in you so much, especially the seize the day. And I feel like that is reminding me of the story I've heard you share that I'd love to touch on about how you came to be doing the work that you're doing because you're a children's book author and did not have a history of working in politics. So tell me what you're most on a quest for in your life now and how that came to be. And curious about how this learning to do and seize the moment intertwines with all of that. Yeah. So I would say. What I'm really on a quest for is ways to engage really thoughtfully and purposefully and ways to look beyond the first glance status that I think often defines our very busy attention grabbing world. The way that I got into this work was that after the election of 2016, I was fairly rattled by the election of Donald Trump and I hadn't engaged very deeply politically. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, maybe I need to. But I didn't know exactly where to plug in. And the quickest and most obvious places of, oh, everyone, call your senators and talk to your congressperson and make sure you're going down to DC next weekend. All of those things felt distant for me. And like they weren't places where I could have a real impact. But I was lucky enough in December of 2016 to attend a holiday party where there was a New York state senator speaking. And what I heard from him that night was all about how the issues that I most cared about in this country, from education funding to environmental policy, to health care, to civil rights, to abortion and voting rights, that those things were really being decided in state capitals and not in Washington, D.C., and for me, that was the deeper lens that I needed to take action because I realized that state legislative races are often cheaper, easier to impact, much more local. And focusing there gave me a really powerful way to dig in and helped me in that quest to find sort of a 
a next level place to engage. As you're sharing this, I'm thinking about what a beautiful blend what you've been on a quest for is between the qualities of your father and your mother, that you found this way to be the deep thinker and to be strategic, but also to move into action. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. And that really makes me smile because I do think that both of them were hugely impactful on my life and in very different ways. So it is nice to think that I'm honoring two pieces there. So how did things unfold from that serendipitous and life-changing talk you heard from the New York State Senator to how the state's project and giving circles came to be? Well, that night, we learned a lot about the power of state governments. And I realized that there were all these light bulbs that went off for me. I started connecting the dots on some things that hadn't made sense to me, like bathroom bills passing first in my home state of North Carolina. And then in all of these other states across the country, I started to realize, okay, that was Raleigh doing that. And things like standard ground gun bills, which passed first in Tallahassee and let Trayvon Martin's murderer go free and then passed in all these other states. I started realizing, okay, that was lawmakers in Florida. And I don't know any of their names. And those things happened under an Obama presidency. So it didn't matter who was in the White House because states were deciding these things. And When I realized that, the other piece that came into focus for me was the fact that it's often cheaper to change the balance of power in an entire state chamber than it is to win a single competitive congressional seat. So congressional races cost millions and millions of dollars, but state legislative races do not. They're still small and local and can be won with a simple set of tactics as long as they're fully supported. And so That night, I got together with a bunch of other children's book authors in Brooklyn, and we formed what we started to call a giving circle. And when Daniel Squadron resigned from the New York State Senate a few months later to start the state's project, we became the first giving circle to help fund the electoral work that was happening there. And we got involved in Virginia in 2017. They have odd year elections. And so our goal was to help flip the House of Delegates, which was in right wing control at that point. And we invested in 10 races, nine of those folks won their seats, and the balance of power got so close in Richmond, just one seat away from flipping, that the next year, Virginia expanded Medicaid and 400,000 people got health care who hadn't had it before. Our giving circle felt really connected to that policy outcome, and we wanted to see more change. And so I got together with Daniel Squadron, and we decided that there should be a giving circles program at the state's project to help other people form these circles with friends and neighbors and family and networks, because it's an incredibly potent place to have impact. You know, I'm not someone who can hand a giant check to a politician, but I am someone who can gather a living room or a backyard or a Zoom room and raise a really impactful total for these races. And the state's project does the research to figure out which are the tipping point seats in the states where power shifts are possible. And giving circles fund the electoral work. And that has been an incredible program to help run. We're engaging over 200 giving circles across the country. And for me, it has been personally empowering to know that I can organize people and be a real guiding light towards strategic political giving at the foundations of our democracy. And that holiday party really started it all. That's amazing. I often ask people if they had a spark moment that led them on their current quest. And it sounds like, You had several in succession, but it all began in sitting in that for the first living room, hearing Daniel speak, but then gathering your fellow friends. And I assume a lot of them were moms. I'm just guessing the the children's book authors, as they often are. It's so powerful. And I know I so much relate to your story as well, because I was also just completely freaked out. I think I went through all the stages of grief after Trump was elected and it was just before I was getting ready to launch the Mother's Quest podcast. And I had to find my way back to where is my impact? What am I supposed to do now? And for a little while, I didn't feel like I knew what the steps were. And then I was able to come to my own path, which is I think that the podcast can be a vehicle for highlighting important conversations and building community and helping moms especially step into our own voice and power so that we can be more engaged because I, like you, I think I sort of slept through that election and just assumed that Hillary Clinton, the first woman and mother would be in the White House. 
And it was a real shock afterwards. So I so appreciate hearing how your process unfolded. And I know that that experience of kind of stepping into our voice and impact and empowerment has been true for a lot of us. Yeah, absolutely. And on that day, my older daughter was in kindergarten during the November 2016 elections. And our polling place was her elementary school. And we walked to vote with pictures of both of my grandmothers in our hands. And she kind of looked up at me at a certain moment and said, mom, I can't wait to be president. And that day is so clear in my mind because it was so different the next day. And yeah, it had a profound impact on me and really did, like you're saying for yourself, just spur me to find my place to plug in and find my impact. Absolutely. I think this is a beautiful segue to diving into what I call the epic life guideposts. Epic life for me is a metaphor for that kind of life where I feel like I'm really focusing on the things that matter, that I'm writing the story of my own life in a way that someday when I'm with my grandchildren, I'm telling them about the things that I did and the issues that I cared about and took action on. And then EPIC also is an acronym mnemonic for the guideposts that I think help us to live that kind of life, especially when we're raising our kids. So the first letter E stands for engaging mindfully with our kids. And so I'm smiling, imagining you walking to school with your daughters. And I'd love to hear, as you've been engaging in this work, what have you explored and learned about ways to connect your own children to all that you're learning and to become engaged citizens themselves? Yeah, well, my daughters are now in fifth grade and eighth grade. So I've got a rising middle schooler and a rising high schooler on my hands, which is a different situation than it was back then, back in 2016. But I think they have watched me go from being an author, which they honestly barely remember, to being an activist and a political change maker in a lot of ways. And they can kind of recite parts of the speech that I often give to giving circles and groups who are wanting to engage with state legislatures. They know a lot about state legislatures. And even when they were going through and learning about American government in their classrooms, they would often bring up state legislatures because it's not a common topic to be taught. In fact, when they learn about the three branches of government, of course, that focus is on Washington, D.C., but both of them told me in that year of school that they raised their hands and said, did you know that every state also has those three branches of government in the state capital? And that made me really proud. <laughs> so, I love that. Yeah. So I know that they're listening. But I think that what I have tried to do, especially as they've gotten older and a little more interested in their friends than they are in me, is I try to be as present as I can in the moments when I'm home with them. And for me, that looks like just doing my work at the dining room table, for example, instead of at my desk, or just being on the couch on the weekends and reading a paper version of the newspaper instead of reading the newspaper on my phone. I made that decision very specifically because I realized that I was often reading news or articles but when I was reading those things on my phone, it really took my presence out of the room in a way that reading a paper copy just doesn't. And so I really do try to pick up a paper book. I really try to read the weekend newspaper that gets delivered to us in paper form, because even though I'm reading it and I'm engaged in the articles, I'm there in the room with them in a way that I'm just not when I'm on my phone. That's been a very tangible shift that I've made because I noticed that it changed how we interacted when I did that. And that's been incredible too. Yeah, that's such an amazing tip. I am also <laughs> trying to figure out how to be more present while I'm also doing things that really matter. I love the idea of paying attention to the moments where also they're curious and agree so much that there's so much that they're listening and paying attention to in their observation of us. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Really powerful. Well, the next guidepost P is about our passionate and purposeful impact. And we've already been talking about that. I'm curious what else you feel like is important for us to know about how we can have an impact and particularly in this election that's right in front of us. Yeah, 
One of the things that I talk about with Giving Circle leaders is that starting a Giving Circle with the States Project does mean kind of focusing on state legislative power. And that has incredible impact, not only in the states that we work in, but also on the federal level, because of course, states decide voting rights and they draw the district lines that decide who goes to Congress and many state laws rise up to the Supreme Court. You know, of course, it was a Mississippi law that took down Roe. And if that one hadn't done it, there were 16 other state governments that had queued up abortion bans with the explicit purpose of rising up to the Supreme Court to challenge Roe. And the presidency is a real piece of this puzzle as well, because the path that the Trump team tried in 2020 to steal the presidency ran directly through state legislatures. Trump, in December of 2020, called lawmakers from Michigan and Pennsylvania and Arizona to the Oval Office to ask them to change their electoral college slates. And so having pro-democracy majorities in the states where it's going to be the closest is really important this November. So there are, the stakes are very high, but what I tell folks who form giving circles and set goals and reach out to friends and family is that what they're really doing is turning on a porch light for strategic political giving. There is wild emotional political giving that happens, especially in a presidential year, because people feel panicked or afraid or sometimes inspired by a great ad. (laughs) And all of those things make sense, but they don't lead to strategic investment. And when folks work with us and choose a target state, no one will ever have heard of the candidates that are in these tipping point seats, right? They're not going to be on MSNBC at night. They're not going to be on the front page of national newspapers or even the back page of national newspapers. They are local candidates, but they are the people who are deciding whether abortion is legal in their state or deciding whether voting rights are expanded or contracted or deciding whether Medicaid is expanded in line with the Affordable Care Act from the federal level and and many more laws. And so They really are working at a foundational level and people are looking for a way to have strategic impact with the dollars that they put forward politically and giving people the gift of strategic political giving really is less of an ask and more of an offer. So a lot of people who start Mm. giving circles get a little nervous about, well, I don't know. I don't want to ask my friends for money. And With 100% of my being, I feel that what I'm doing when I ask people to join my own giving circle is I am offering them an opportunity to have a political impact that they didn't know was possible. And everyone is looking for that right now. So I feel incredibly solid in that work. And my goal is for other folks who start giving circles to feel incredibly confident about making that offer to their people as well. That is so powerful. I come from the nonprofit world, 15 plus years working in youth development and community building. For many of those years, I was a development director. And I remember also feeling like I needed to step into that perspective that when I was asking people for money, that it was an invitation for them to be part of something that they couldn't do on their own that we were making an impact in a way that mattered to them and that they were actually seeking how they could support the cause that we were building our work around. And I love thinking about that in terms of political engagement and then particularly for the giving circles. That's so powerful. Yeah, I agree. It's funny when I started working at the States Project, a few months in a friend asked me, oh, how's the fundraising gig going? And I was like, (laughs) fundraising? I was like, I'm flipping state legislatures. And she was like, yeah, through fundraising, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, I guess I'm fundraising. But I hadn't thought of it that way. I really felt like every room I walked into to speak, I was telling them the secret. This is how you have impact on democracy and all the issues you care about. You're welcome. (laughs) And that still is the way that I feel. And it's been an incredibly empowering place to come from. And I didn't realize how much power we have, we all have, when we get very passionate about something and move the people around us to join us in that passion. It's incredible. I mean, I, not just for my Giving Circle with the States project, but also in my regular life, I am more of an organizer for my community, for my kids' public school, 
an advocate for my block, all of these things, because I started to realize how much I could do, especially when I could organize people to join me. And that has been a way for me to tend my own corner better than it has been at any other time in my life. Mm. So this evening, I'm hosting with my mom on Zoom a co-working session to help all of us in the giving circle think about and strategize and then actually use that time together to start inviting more people into our circle. We're halfway towards our $10,000 goal and we want to hit that goal. And I am going to start the meeting tonight with this story and this perspective that you shared. Oh, wonderful. That is great to hear. I think this is a great opportunity to move into I invested in ourselves because you've already begun talking about this. The I guidepost is about how we care for ourselves, how we invest in ourselves, how we find joy, how we sustain ourselves, especially when we're doing this hard work. And so you've already shared some of the perspectives that you hold that have enabled you to continue to do this important and powerful work. What else do you feel like you've learned on your journey since you started giving circles and working on the state's project about how to invest in yourself? Well, something that has really changed about my schedule is that I now do a lot of evening events, Zooms and gatherings where I speak. And because of that, my time is just used very differently. So I make a very, very specific effort to block off portions of my day where I'm not in a meeting and I'm not completing a task, but I am actually doing a 20 minute yoga video or just sitting on the couch and zoning out. And I even intentionally put something on my calendar, which I called WT. And that was just a mysterious acronym for my coworkers. (laughs) But for me, what it meant was window time. And window time was just going up into this comfy yellow chair that we have in our living room and staring out the window. I really wanted to direct myself to do nothing and to be very comfortable doing nothing. Now, of course, it doesn't mean doing nothing. And I often would come up with an idea that I wanted to put into place at work (laughs) during that time because my brain is still worrying. But it was and is a time when I give myself a bit of mental space. And often, honestly, like the best ideas drop in. You know, it's like thinking of great lines when you're in the shower. That window time has been incredibly valuable for me. And I feel good about building that into my schedule because if I were working a full day and then doing two events, one at six and one at eight each night, I would burn out very, very quickly. So I do need to build that time into my day. And I've been really intentional about doing that. There are always gems in every conversation and things that I immediately say, I'm going to take that into my life. Window time is resonating as incredibly powerful. I love that so much. And I'm actually thinking I have this beautiful window seat looking out to the front of our house and it's my dog's favorite place to be. And so I'll often go sit there with her and the combination of being present and petting my dog and just being with her and looking outside the two together is really magical for reducing stress. So I'm going to start to call that my window time. I know where to go. And I'm going to actually see about building it into my schedule. I love that. And you're right. The animals lead us because of course, that yellow chair is also my cat's favorite place. (laughs) Love picturing that. What kind of cat do you have so I can have the complete image I have two, actually. They're both tabbies. One's very, very gray, like a shadow, and one is gray and white. Love it. Well, we are at our last guidepost C, which stands for Connected to a Strong Support Network. This guidepost is a reminder that we do not have to do this alone. You have so many threads about how you built community. What do you feel like are some of the biggest lessons you've learned about how to do that? This question has made me think of a very specific moment in time. You know, as you go through adulthood and you make new friends, they become friends in certain moments, right? You've got your childhood friends, your high school friends, your college friends, your friends from your first job. And then slowly it's like, I don't know, we're adults. Are we making friends? Are we doing this? And what I realized was when my daughter started going to our local public school, There were a bunch of, honestly, moms who were often around at drop-off and who I kind of got to know and our kids shared classrooms. 
And I thought of them as the people in my life, but not necessarily as friends until COVID hit. And when COVID hit, my husband and I, after a couple of weeks of sirens and mobile morgues outside our home in Brooklyn, we decided we had to get upstate, get to a place where there was more space. So we rented a a cabin in the woods with our kids and it was a little scary and a little lonely. And then we had a death in the family that we couldn't be there for. And my daughter, my oldest daughter mentioned it on her classroom Zoom the next morning. And of course, that was in the time when, when the kids were on Zoom, the parents were right there doing their own Zooms in the background. And my phone started just exploding with texts. And it was all these women from the parents of my daughter's classmates and these women who I had known in the neighborhood. And they were just saying, where are you? What do you need? How can we help? And for the next couple of weeks, we continued to get these packages mailed to this cabin in the woods that we had rented with baked goods and bagels from the city and little notes and gifts. And to me, it was like, oh, this feels like church. I hadn't been to church since I was a kid, but that's what church felt like. And it was the community. And I didn't realize that I had such a strong community until I had a moment where I needed people to have my back and they did. And that group of women is still a very strong presence in my life. Today, we have a group chat that is so active that I have to keep it silent during the day. And I love it. And that connection is very special at this moment in time. And I didn't even know it was there until I needed it. That feels particularly resonant right now as we're seeing the devastation of these hurricanes and hearing about the stories about how people come together to help each other across all kinds of differences, which is a reminder that we don't have to be so divided in our country. Yes. And I recently read a beautiful essay about that written by someone who's in North Carolina, watching people help each other right now in the wake of Helene. And it was beautiful. And at the end of it, she said, we could live like this all the time. We don't have to wait for there to be a disaster. And that really resonated with me. Yeah. Before we leave this guidepost, I'm curious whether there are any other thoughts you have about even in doing the state's project work, how we think about unifying our country. Yeah, well, I have really come to see our country as the whole nation, right? I mean, it makes sense, the United States. I think that state borders should not feel like country borders. And I live in New York. I grew up in North Carolina. I've lived in other places and my siblings are in different states. And this is our country. And to me, the dividing lines that are state lines really are not separations. And we have to care about people all over the country. And I think that many people do. And what I see when giving circles come together is that they are coming together across borders just with shared values and shared interest in funding public education and making sure that people have the right to privacy and their own medical decisions and making sure that folks have health care and a living wage and voting rights. I think there's so much more agreement than there is disagreement, especially on the big kitchen table issues in the country. And to watch people work together like that for the things they believe in is really powerful. And when I watch Giving Circles form, one of the things that I love about it is we talked a little earlier about how there's so much emotional giving that happens in politics. The thing about the Giving Circles model is that The emotional part is built in. You're doing Mm. it with your people, your friends, your family, your neighbors. And the strategy is that we're, we're in these tipping point seats and we're shifting power to lawmakers who want to improve people's lives. So the emotional part is baked in. And that's what I really love about the Giving Circles model. It's connective. You so beautifully talk about all of this and make it so clear. I feel like all of my thinking about states and why they matter has really shifted in hearing you share. So we ended up picking Pennsylvania and our giving circle chose it unanimously. And it could literally not be further away from me where I am in California, but I'm feeling really invested and connected to it and seeing how it does have an impact on the whole country. Before we go to 
your invitation to give me and anyone listening a challenge. I want to ask you one last question. If you think about what I call an epic snapshot moment, one of those moments in your life that you realize this is everything I've been after and it's the kind that you want to bottle up and slow time down. What is one recent moment that encapsulates a lot of these things that we've been talking about today for you? Gosh, to be honest, I feel like I have had so many in the journey since I started working at the States Project. And if we're going to zero in on one, I'll just go with a recent one because I (laughs) I guess that's the recency bias. But I did have a big event on Sunday night, which was a public Zoom to talk about the States Project and the power of state legislatures. And it brought together a bunch of high profile people, artists, actors, influencers, and people who were just on the call because they cared about drawing attention to these places that don't get the political spotlight of Washington, D.C., but do have so much power. And to be on a call with folks like Octavia Spencer and Josh Gad and Bradley Whitford and Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Elizabeth Banks. It was an incredible moment. And what I love about working with high profile folks like that and working with all the people I've met on this journey, everyone from nurses to teachers to professional organizers who just know how to bring people together to retired folks, to college kids, giving circle leaders come in all shapes and sizes. And what I have learned is that these are just people who want to make a difference. And whether they're a famous Hollywood star or someone who is just starting out in the world at their first job, but wants to organize their coworkers, it's the same. And in a moment like Sunday night, when I was among some of the starriest stars, it was a little bit of a pinch me moment. My younger daughter came in and heard the voice of Olaf talking about state legislatures when (laughs) Josh Gad was on. And that, that was a real moment. But what I love about it is that everyone who gets involved gets the same interactions with our team and is valued the same way and is engaged at whatever level they want to be engaged at. For me, that's been a really powerful thing. But I will say that Sunday night was an especially glittering moment and a fun one. It was star studded and full of heart. I was on that call too because my niece, Nicole, who I know you know, was instrumental in organizing that event. And it was also so beautiful to see her reach out to our family on our, we have our family chat. And so at various points during the week, it was like, hey, I need more people to register. Can you spread the word? And then all of us were sharing our experience of the evening on the chat as it was unfolding. So I agree, it was really beautiful and amazing to see so many people come together and with the same consistent message that I feel like you just really in amazing ways continue to frame the power of states and our ability to make an impact there that really sets the tone for everything. So I want to acknowledge you for that. Well, thank you. And Nicole has brought so much to our team and it's just been an amazing year working with her. So that was an incredible piece of the evening as well. Now there's an opportunity for you to offer us some kind of a challenge, what would you invite us to do? So what I would invite folks to do is to think about your collective power. So we've been talking a lot about connectivity and community. And to me, that is the antidote in this moment in our country's history when things feel pretty divided sometimes. And much in the way that reading an article on my phone feels more distant than reading an article in paper. Sometimes it's tiny steps like that to feel more connected to the present moment. And sometimes it's helping a neighbor out in a crisis, but maybe not waiting for the crisis next time. And so my challenge to people is think about your collective and your community and what you can do together. And of course, if you want to form a giving circle with the States Project, I'll be there and our team will be there to help you. Because the work there, and honestly, the work of any organizing you might want to do is to bring a person who can bring a person who can bring a person. 
and everybody can bring one friend. And when everybody brings one friend, you end up with a large and powerful group that can really move the needle on anything that you care to focus on. And that is very empowering. We do not have to be witnesses to what's happening to our democracy. We do not have to be witnesses to things that are against our values. We can get involved, especially when we walk with the people beside us. Mm. It's a beautiful note to end on. We close every episode with acknowledgements and takeaways. It's an opportunity for me to reflect on what I'm leaving this conversation with. And also for you, I said before we started to record that you are going, going, going. Thank goodness you also have your window time. But I'm hoping that this little pause on all the things is maybe bringing some more things to high relief for you. So I'm going to start and then I'll pass it to you. I'm going to actually start in a somewhat strange way, which is that before we got on the call, sometimes I like to draw a card from my favorite Oracle deck designed by a fellow mother on a quest, Lindsay Para. And the card I pulled felt right the minute I pulled it. It's the fear card. And basically the card said, fear may have a seat at the table, but it need not hold control. And I want to acknowledge you for the work that you've built, because I think as the election date has been approaching, particularly for my mom, but also for me, there was a lot of fear and anxiety and a sense of hopelessness. Like, I can't believe this is happening and I don't even know what to do. And so being able to create the giving circle alongside my mom and then to bring in all of our generations, to have Nicole be part of that and my sisters. And my mom has enlisted 100% of her book club and they've been together for 50 plus years. And now they all have a place to focus and move away from fear into a sense of agency. It's really important. And I also hope that in our own little way, we are going to have an impact. So I want to acknowledge you for that first. And then just a few things I'm taking. Again, this awareness about stepping into our power that we each have some unique way where we can make a difference. This idea of blending thoughtfulness and space for strategic thinking with action, the window time for sure. And then this beautiful thing that you shared from the essay about moving beyond our divides and that we could live like this all the time. So thank you for all of that. Thank you. I love those takeaways and I'm grateful that you're sharing with me how engaging with the Giving Circle has helped folks. I love that. Anything you feel like you're leaving this conversation with that feels more clear about your own life and your own impact? Yeah, well, I love the way we started with my parents because I do think that honoring both of them in a combination way in terms of strategic thinking and action really does feel beautiful. Another moment that I thought of was my father passed away about 20 years ago this summer. And I was lucky enough, you know, through this political work to meet the actor Richard Schiff, who played Toby on The West Wing for a long time. And The West Wing was my father's absolute favorite show. And we spent the last weekend that we spent together, we spent it binging episodes of The West Wing. <laughs> And I got to share that with Richard Schiff when I met him and talked to him. And we both ended up getting tears in our eyes as we took a picture together. And that was a beautiful moment where I felt like my father was incredibly present in the work that I'm doing 20 years later, two careers later that he didn't even see. But I do feel like he's really with me in a lot of ways. And what I also realized when you asked me about the moment, I named the celebrity filled Sunday night, but it really is true that Every time I'm in a room with a giving circle or a Zoom with a giving circle where people are engaged and really taking action together, it's incredibly moving. And it's not really about it being a group of celebrities, although I'm always a little awestruck that those folks spend their time this way sometimes, but it really is a very powerful thing. And every living room, every Zoom, every backyard that I get to be in with people and do this feels energizing and affirming in a way that gives me a lot of hope for our democracy. And we need that hope right now. So for me, it, this work has been a real hope generator. And that question of think about one moment, it made me think of a thousand moments. And how lucky am I that I thought of so many? Absolutely. 
Well, we will all hold on to these themes around hope and the ability to work together. And I feel confident that when the election comes, we will have good news. And even if not, I know what to do next with your example. Well, thank you so much. I am so happy to have this conversation. It's been wonderful for me as well. And thank you for starting a giving circle. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about how to join the Mother's Quest community, visit mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and help us to spread the word. I want to end with some words to help light the way on your quest. Seize the day. Love your people. Honor your gifts. Until next time.